you know, I think no matter how passionate you are about criminal justice reform, when we get to this part of the, uh, of the symposium, uh, I need a, a cup of coffee, which apparently we're serving in the smallest available cups that are mass manufactured, uh, and a conversation about the future of official immunity to wake me right up. So uh, I think this is actually a really important topic. It's a topic uh, that uh, when we talk about prosecutorial accountability, we've just had a conversation about one way to bring accountability out, which is to uh, use the power of the vote. Um, but I think once uh, in one, of the, one of the speakers at the end said, you know, it's really important to watch and see that the prosecutors, when they're elected and now they're operating from the inside, that they actually embrace those changed behaviors. And part of that is because there aren't a lot of, of, uh, of accountability mechanisms other than the vote to ensure quality in prosecutors' offices. Um, why is it that way? What can we do about it? Um, and, and how can we change that moving forward? Uh, and to, uh, to lead that panel is the, the last but not least of our fabulous fellows, Asli Bashir. So I'll let you take it away, Asli, and go from here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I actually think it's very appropriate that this is the last panel because if there is a recurring motif throughout this uh, symposium, it's really the need for accountability in a system and the need for there to be some kind of way to specifically focus on uh, prosecutors and the people who make the key decisions in the justice system. Um, you'll know, in the uh, brochure, I noticed that the uh, it focuses uh, the little description for this panel focuses on qualified immunity, but uh, it's uh, the title is on official immunity because this panel is actually going to discuss both qualified and absolute immunity. And the reason for that is that they're two very interrelated doctrines and the issues uh, and challenges for people trying to uh, hold government actors accountable and trying to vindicate civil rights uh, are generally the same. Uh, and I think that uh, we can have a pretty fruitful discussion kind of thinking about both of those issues together. Uh, so in recent years, judges, scholars, and advocates have begun to rethink the interrelated, as I said, judge judgment doctrines of absolute and qualified immunity. Absolute immunity completely shields judges, and importantly, prosecutors, from any liability for the prosecution of a case, even in cases where prosecutors have demonstrated egregious misconduct. Uh, it sometimes applies to other officials in specific contexts as well. At the same time, qualified immunity shields public officials, including police officers, from liability for unlawful misconduct unless a plaintiff can show the misconduct violated clearly established law. Although not an absolute bar, in practice, the doctrine poses a high legal hurdle for civil rights claims, posing challenges for those who seek relief for rights violations and those who seek to hold government agents accountable for misconduct. So this panel is gonna think about the implications of a potential shift away from this doctrine, the challenges of trying to uphold civil rights and hold agents accountable in uh, the current legal regime, uh, and also kind of the uh, genealogy of our official immunity um, uh, kind of landscape today. And I'm very excited to have a panel of real experts who know a lot more about this than I do, and who have a lot of experience litigating these cases, and in some cases have actually really um, brought the landmark cases that have led to what we uh, now think of as the uh, Supreme Court doctrine on immunity. Um, so I'll start with Katie Chambly Ryan, who's immediately to my right. Uh, Katie Chambly Ryan is the coordinator of the Prosecutor Project at Civil Rights Corps, which aims to create accountability for officials who have historically acted with impunity, and to, their goal is to change, uh, change entrenched narratives about the purpose and effects of criminal prosecution. Uh, if you're kind of familiar with the civil litigation landscape, this is a pretty radical uh, goal of, of a practice group in any law firm, and they're really doing very unique work in this country. Um, their project has resulted in legal challenges to pretrial diversion programs operated by the Maricopa, Maricopa County Attorney's Practice, uh, Maricopa County Attorney's Office uh, in Arizona. Uh, and they had a practice of charging hundreds of dollars in fees to people accused of possessing small amounts of marijuana, and, uh, and they've also brought, I think you, many of you have probably read about this, a civil action against the New Orleans District Attorney, Leon Canizaro, um, who was fabricating subpoenas or directing his subordinates to do so um, in order to coerce crime victims and witnesses of crimes into submitting to private out-of-court interrogations, untruthful testimony, and, um, and also oversaw an office-wide practice of presenting fraudulent information in court to persuade judges to issue arrest warrants. Uh, this uh, is illegal if that's not already obvious, uh, but it was also the kind of thing that I think people just uh, before Civil Rights Corps brought this case um, 
we're not even thinking of challenging because it, it's there's just a sense that you can't really do anything to prosecutors. And I lived in New Orleans for a long time, and I um, am familiar with that office. And uh, it's pretty well known in the legal community there that there's a lot of rampant misconduct in that office. But uh, but it's very new for a practice group to really be trying to challenge the practices. Uh, Ms. Chandley Ryan joined Civil Rights Corps after four years as a staff attorney in the Capital Litigation Unit at the Southern Center for Human Rights. At the Southern Center, she represented indigent defendants on death row in Georgia and Alabama in both state and federal courts, and represented Timothy Tyrone Foster as co-counsel in Foster v. Chapman at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and that case resulted in, two, in a seven to one opinion reversing Foster's conviction and death sentence because of racial discrimination and jury selection. Uh, Clark Neely is Vice President for Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. He writes frequently on issues of police and prosecutor accountability and overcriminalization, and his writing has appeared in numerous natural, national publications and law reviews. Uh, Mr. Neely serves as co-counsel in the landmark case District of Columbia v. Heller, in which the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own a gun. He is the author of Terms of Engagement, How Our Court Should Enforce the Constitution's Promise of Limited Government. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at George Mason and Anthony Antonin Scalia School of Law, where he teaches constitutional litigation and public interest law. Uh, Neely is also the co-author of a recently submitted amicus brief in the case I.B. Doe v. Woodard. Uh, and, that case, and that brief is in support of the petitioner I.B. who seeks to challenge the constitutionality of the warrantless strip searching of a four-year-old preschool student by a caseworker. Uh, the brief argues that qualified immunity lacks any proper legal or historical basis and that it is not entitled to respect under the doctrine of stare decisis. Uh, Professor David Rudofsky uh, is familiar to people uh, in this community. He uh, is one of the nation's leading civil rights and criminal defense attorneys. He's a founding partner in the Philadelphia law firm of Karras, Rudofsky, Messing, and Feinberg, LLP, and a senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, Professor Rudofsky has argued two very significant civil liberties cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, Forsyth v. Mitchell, uh, which is regarding government wiretapping, and City of Canton v. Harris, which is regarding municipal liability of failure to properly train police. Uh, Professor Rudofsky has also literally written multiple treatises that touch on the topic of this panel, including police misconduct, law and litigation, the law of arrest, search, and seizure in Pennsylvania, and the rights of prisoners. Uh, he's received numerous awards for his work, including a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Uh, so I think uh, this panel is, uh, comes from multiple angles and is uh, very adequate to discuss this issue. Uh, so I think um, I'm going to start off with Professor Rudofsky, um, who's going to give a, a kind of an opening statement on, uh, on official immunity. Right. Well, thanks. Great to be here. Um, interesting panel and um, a very important one in terms of accountability. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, immunity, prosecutorial immunity, qualified immunity for police officers and other government officials, uh, all very important uh, in its own right. It's a kind of limited topic, but I think it's important to place it in a larger perspective, some of which has been covered uh, uh, to some extent by other panels and addressed by other panels. Because when we talk about immunity, we're really talking about the question of accountability and limits on accountability uh, because immunity kind of assumes uh, that the defendant has done something wrong. Uh, they violated the Constitution in some way, and yet for some policy or other reason, uh, we think it's important not to hold them accountable uh, in damages. Um, and, you know, and that may be true and may have some arguments in some respects, but you have to put it in a larger context and understand how our system uh, builds in accountability not only through civil actions, but through the criminal law, the exclusionary rule, and other possible ways of holding people accountable. Um, uh, civil damage actions aren't the only ways in which we can hold people accountable. Uh, we could have a robust system, for example, of injunctive relief uh, to prevent uh, officials from uh, wrongdoing in the future. Uh, we could have professional accountability in, in our systems. We could hold police officers responsible internally. Uh, we could hold prosecutors uh, responsible by bar associations, by prosecutorial offices. Uh, we could have robust um, remedies in criminal prosecutions, the exclusionary rule, for example, uh, to try to deter uh, misconduct. Uh, there are a lot of ways of thinking about holding uh, uh, officials accountable uh, and to fashion a system right, that, that works and interlocks together. Uh, the problem, of course, is for the past 25, 30 years, maybe longer, certainly since the Warren Court, uh, the Supreme Court has uh, 
increasingly restricted accountability across the board. Um, and often it's a shell game. Um, uh, so when the court limits the exclusionary rule, for example, uh, they'll often say, well, sure, we're limiting the exclusionary rule here, but there are other remedies that, uh, that the defendant may have. They can file a suit for damages. They can seek injunctive relief, right? Um, uh, so on holding one level of accountability open while we restrict the other. Uh, and then, of course, when they limit civil remedies, they say the opposite, right? Well, we've got the exclusionary rule, so uh, uh, we can live with that. So you've got to look at the larger picture. And when you look at the larger picture today in 2019, it's a court, particularly the Supreme Court, that is increasingly protective uh, of government officials, um, uh, increasingly skeptical of virtually all the remedies, judicial remedies, that have been built up over the years. Um, and in that way has really limited uh, governmental accountability in, in a large number of ways. So uh, I just kind of put that out there because it's not just a question of immunity that we should be talking about. But let me spend five minutes on, on the question of qualified immunity. Um, I know we're gonna be talking about prosecutorial immunity, which is uh, obviously equally important, but qualified immunity, particularly with respect to law enforcement officials. Um, um, and, and again, it's, it, it's one of these doctrines, it, it started as a small weed in the garden, and it's now taken over, right, <laughs> the entire garden of, 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 of civil rights. Um, um, uh, when Section 1983 was uh, reinvigorated in the early 1960s with Monroe versus Pape, there was an early decision on, on qualified immunity, uh, which I actually didn't agree, disagree with. It was a case called Pearson versus Ray. Um, it was a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit against a police officer in one of the southern states who had arrested protesters at a restaurant protesting segregation, right? Um, uh, at that point, the state law uh, had not yet been struck down in terms of segregation. Uh, the officer made an arrest. Um, a couple of years later, the Supreme Court said those laws were unconstitutional. Um, the officer was sued and, of course, defended and said, wait a minute, you know, at the time I made that arrest, it was, it was constitutional. I couldn't predict what the Supreme Court was going to do. And the Supreme Court agreed, actually. The Supreme Court agreed with them, I didn't, and I didn't disagree that, okay, if the law was clearly uh, allowed you to do that, and it got changed later, um, it doesn't make much sense, certainly out of fairness, that you could be held responsible for damages. Um, so that was kind of the start of the doctrine. And it, it built a little bit on common law theories of, of both probable cause and good faith, um, that the officer would have to show both as a defense. Um, uh, and certainly we could live with that. Uh, but what we've seen now over the past um, 50 years is an extraordinary expansion of that doctrine. Um, uh, so from this notion of, um, of probable cause and good faith, uh, we went to what the court that called the, the objective standard, started to switch it around and said, uh, that's not protective enough of police officers. It may, the doctrine, the damages actions may over deter them. Uh, and so we're only going to allow lawsuits for damages against officers where the law was clearly established. If the law wasn't clearly established, which of course the jump from Pearson versus Ray, um, uh, then the office has got qualified immunity and you can't sue them. Well, even that, you could think, well, depending on how you define clearly established, that's a pretty ambiguous term, um, you might be able to uh, live with that. Uh, the big step after that, uh, in a couple of cases uh, in, in the US Supreme Court, uh, uh, following Harlow, which was the objective, kind of, was the law clearly established standard, a case called Creighton, um, and then cases since then, have really, really kind of presented this problem. Um, the court now says, not only must the law be clearly established, um, but the plaintiff also has to show that the conduct that the officer engaged in had not been clearly defined as illegal before. So it wasn't just the legal standard. Um, now the plaintiff had to show that the conduct of the officer, whatever the officer did in that situation, um, had to be clearly established, had to have been addressed by a court before, uh, before, you can, before you can get liability. And, 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 and let me show you how uh, this, this doctrine works out. Think about the notion of excessive force um, under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court, as a, as a substantive matter, right, on the question of whether or not an officer has engaged in excessive force or not, what the Supreme Court says, it's a reasonableness test, right? There's no strict liability just because you happen to use too much force. The question is reasonableness. We don't do 20-20, uh, you know, uh, uh, back site. We, we don't do Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, we look at what the officer did. If the officer reasonably could have thought, if the officer reasonably could have thought that the force was necessary, deadly or not, 
Um, that's proper under the Fourth Amendment. A standard that's actually, as we know, very lenient to police officers. Um, uh, it, it gives them a lot of protection. Uh, they don't have to be right necessarily when you wind the clock back and you look at it again. Um, uh, they have protection under the constitutional standard. But the notion is if you act unreasonably, right, uh, then you're liable in damages. Well, place qualified immunity above that, right? Uh, because as these cases now get litigated, um, not only must the plaintiff show that the officer acted unreasonably under the Fourth Amendment, which is a high enough standard, the officer, and this, if you can work this through your mind, you're better than I am, uh, the officer then gets to argue, well, yes, you found that I acted unreasonably, but a reasonable officer could have thought I acted reasonably. And the Supreme Court has actually bought that doctrine, right? Um, uh, they've said for qualified immunity, it is possible for an unreasonable officer, we've already found this officer to have acted unreasonably, actually acted unreasonably under the circumstances. Uh, why? Because we've never addressed this fact situation before. The officer simply didn't know that, right? So there is something incoherent uh, about the doctrine uh, because we have got constitutional rights that are not strict liability. The officer probable cause is a very low standard, right? You don't have to be right about your arrest. It could be an innocent person, excessive force. Um, so the doctrine has really worked now to really limit um, uh, 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 the availability of doctrine. Let me just give you one example. Of, you know, you, you look at these cases, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of them over the past uh, number of years, and it's easy for both sides to kind of cherry pick the case that they like, but <laughs> let, let me just give you an example of, of how broad this doctrine is um, from a recent uh, Ninth Circuit case, a case called Jessup versus City of Fresno. And I'll just read the first paragraph of the opinion. And when you hear this, you think, why is this case even on appeal? How could there even be a question about liability here? Um, uh, the, uh, the first paragraph, the opinion reads that the plaintiffs appeal an order granting a motion for summary judgment on qualified immunity filed by the city of Fresno and the defendant officers in an action alleging that the city officers in this case violated the Fourth Amendment when they stole appellant's property after conducting a search and seizure pursuant to a warrant. The facts alleged in the complaint was that the officers had a search warrant, they went into the house, they seized a fair amount of property, some may have been contraband, and they stole money and didn't list it in the return of the, of, of the plaintiffs, right? So you look at that and you say, number one, how could there be a question under the Fourth Amendment as to whether that violates the Fourth Amendment, and how could an officer who steals money Right? if you could prove that, right? the intentional taking of someone else's money, which wasn't authorized right, under the warrant, have a qualified immunity. Ninth Circuit says, well, we've got a difficult question here. We're not even sure the Fourth Amendment prohibits um, uh, that kind of action, that you've got a remedy against the officer for that. But even if you do, no court has ever said before, no court has ever said before that it violates the Fourth Amendment to steal somebody's property in enforcing a search warrant, and therefore you've got no claim. And I look at it, and I read it again, and I read it a third time, and that's exactly what the court said. Um, so again, putting aside the fact that there are extreme cases, uh, you can just see how broad and, 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 and possibly self-defeating this doctrine is. Thank you. Uh, and Clark Neely? Well, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank John and the Quattrones and Ashley for, for moderating. Um, <laughs> I guess I want to try to provide a bit of um, context because I do think accountability is, is incredibly important uh, and the, what I characterize as our near zero accountability policy for law enforcement um, is about the opposite, about as opposite of accountability as you can have. Um, I want to start at a somewhat high level and, and make a point that I suspect is, um, it's been more or less you know, sort of uh, in the air and sometimes specifically addressed, but I think it's important to come out and say it. Um, I really think there's a radical disconnect uh, between the, the desires of ordinary citizens in terms of what they want from the criminal justice system and how they want the criminal justice system to operate and the way the system actually operates. Um, and we can look at that sort of at a somewhat macro level and we can also look at it at the level of specific policies. From a macro level, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, use of force and respect for rights. Um, I think I'll tell a story right now. Um, this is a, a case that uh, uh, Cato is involved in as an amicus. Um, this is a real case. You wouldn't think that it was, same with Jessup, but this is a real case. It's pending in front of the, um, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. It arose out of an incident in Nebraska. Uh, there was um, an incident at a public swimming pool um, that um, uh, concerned one of the 
one of the people at the pool, um, she thought there was some kind of a domestic uh, dispute going on. Turns out it was just horseplay, but she didn't, she misinterpreted the situation. So she calls the police. They come to the pool to determine, you know, what happened and if anybody needs any help. And uh, they, they get the woman who's the presumptive victim out of the pool, and she explains that it's a misunderstanding, it's just horseplay, no big deal. Uh, as she's having this discussion with one of the police officers, oh, and this will be important in a second, she's about five feet tall, she's even smaller than Professor Barco. Um, and as she's talking to the police officer and reassuring them that there's nothing to worry about and she's not a victim and she doesn't have any problems, she looks over and she sees that one of her kids is being hassled by somebody else at the pool. So she says to the police officer, hey, I need to go and, and, and help my child, I'll be right back. And he says, no, you're going to stay here and talk to me. And she says, no, I really need to, to go and help my kids. So she turns from the police officer. So again, this is a five foot tall woman wearing a bathing suit, not carrying any weapons, not even uh, anything you could conceal. She's just uh, wanting to go talk to her kid and take care of her kid. As she turns away from the police officer to go help her child, he, get, he puts her in a bear hug, he lifts her up off the ground, turns her upside down and drives her head first into the ground so hard that he breaks her shoulder and knocks her unconscious. The Eighth Circuit granted qualified immunity because there's not a case exactly on point. Maybe the last time that happened in Nebraska, the woman was five foot three, who knows? But qualified immunity is about that bad. So this, this is what we're talking about. This is the kind of, this is what the, the effects that this doctrine has in real life. Um, in terms of whether that officer is or is not going to be held accountable. So use of force and respect for rights, that's one of the sort of macro level disconnects I see between what people want and the way the system actually works. Uh, of course, everybody in this room knows that there are uh, persistent racial disparities throughout the criminal justice system to which the system is largely indifferent. That's another area where there's, a, uh, in my judgment, a disconnect. Then there's the issue of mass incarceration. As most of you probably know, the US has the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. Um, and I think most people sense that that's not something to be proud of and that probably something is out of whack. We can look at the issue of specific policies. Um, I used to do quite a bit of work on civil forfeiture when I was at the Institute for Justice. I litigated civil forfeiture cases. Um, my current organization, the Cato Institute, has done polling on this. More than 80% of people surveyed when civil forfeiture is described to them. Um, this is the policy that enables police to take your property, not by proving that it was involved in some crime, but by merely alleging that it was. More than 80% of people said, I don't like that policy, I don't think it should exist. Law enforcement loves it. Um, another disconnect at the specific level is marijuana and low-level drug possession. In 2016, I sure, I assume most of you know which direction the country is headed in on marijuana legalization. About half the states have partly or wholly decriminalized it, but it remains illegal under federal law. Um, nevertheless, in 2016, there are more arrests for marijuana possession alone than for all violent index crimes combined. An index crime is one that's serious enough that the FBI keeps track of it. So um, you've got the country moving in one direction in terms of how it feels about marijuana legalization or criminalization, and you've got law enforcement continuing to ravage the low-hanging fruit and enforce these laws that don't make anybody's lives better, um, makes a lot of people's lives worse. And then the third specific uh, policy is the one we're talking about today, and that's accountability. Uh, I suspect that most people feel like there should be healthy accountability, robust accountability for law enforcement, and law enforcement's position is basically there should be somewhere between literally zero and a very, very tiny small number that's close to zero. Uh, and they fight really hard for the policies that create this near zero um, policy, or near zero accountability policy. Um, it is, I think, incredibly important to understand that our Constitution very consciously and very deliberately put citizens at the heart of the administration of criminal justice. Uh, so, for example, uh, juries, uh, the, the subject of juries is mentioned, is discussed with, with more words, takes up more space in the Bill of Rights than any other topic. Uh, criminal jury trials are the only right that's mentioned both in the body of the unamended Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. Uh, so this is something that the framers felt very strongly about, uh, but it is the case today that we've essentially eliminated citizen participation in the criminal justice system um, in the form of juries, both in the criminal jury and on the civil side. So there's some new numbers that just came out from the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Um, in fiscal year 2018, 97.4% of all criminal convictions in the federal system were obtained through plea bargain, 97.4%. Um, the Fifth Circuit, where I used to do a lot of my practice, has got a 98.9% plea bargain rate. Second only to the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, just next door in Colorado and other states. They're closing in on the coveted 100%. The plea bargain rate in the, in the Tenth Circuit is 99.1%. That is astonishing, and it represents the practical elimination uh, of the criminal jury trial. 
On the civil side, we've done the same thing uh, using the doctrines that we're here to talk about today. It is very, very difficult to get to a jury, to get to the body that was supposed to be at the center of the administration of criminal justice in this country. It is increasingly difficult for an ordinary citizen to get a case before this body that was placed by the, by the founders at the center of our uh, criminal justice system. Um, and as I'm sure we'll discuss more as, as this panel unfolds, civil liability really is the only practical way of holding uh, members of law enforcement, police and prosecutors accountability. Internal procedures don't work. Um, disciplinary, uh, bar disciplinary procedures don't work. Citizen review boards are a little bit better, but still not terribly efficacious. Uh, and so we have a situation where basically the Constitution intended uh, for the law enforcement or for the criminal justice system to, um, to not only uh, be sort of operated by ordinary citizens sitting as juries, but also to get feedback from that body, to get its feedback from ordinary citizens sitting um, as juries. And we've essentially destroyed that feedback loop. Um, as we'll get into a bit more again later, it is no accident in my judgment that these zero accountability policies like qualified immunity and absolute prosecutorial immunity, these were not democratically enacted policies. They were not the choice of Congress. The actual language of section 1983, which is the primary civil rights law, um, says that every state actor who subjects any citizen to the deprivation of any rights shall be liable to the party injured. There's nothing in there about only clearly established rights or only if the officer was on notice. There's nothing like that in the text of the statute. This was literally invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court, who then attributed the intent to have this immunity built into Section 1983 to Congress. So you've got this sort of two, two branches of government pointing the finger at each other, neither one of them taking responsibility for this insane policy of, of zero or near zero accountability. And I think that's no accident. Um, so as we discussed, um, where should police officers and prosecutors be getting their feedback? when, when you know, they, they use excessive or potentially excessive force, maybe they pick somebody up and drive them headfirst into the ground, uh, or they play some games at trial that impairs the defendant's ability uh, to have a fair trial. Where should they get their feedback when there's an allegation of misconduct? Well, where they should get their feedback, where the Constitution was designed to, to, to provide the feedback, uh, was from ordinary citizens sitting as juries, both criminal and civil. Where do they actually get their feedback? Well, they actually get their feedback primarily from the judiciary. Uh, that applies these incredibly uh, government favoring, often usually made up out of whole cloth um, doctrines like qualified immunity to just give them a big bright green light pretty much no matter uh, what they've done. And, um, and, and I th that's, that's where we stand now. And so I think it's no accident that we see this uh, growing division between what ordinary people want from their criminal justice system uh, and what the criminal justice system actually delivers because basically people have been taken out uh, of that system and uh, put in a position where they can no longer really provide feedback. So what do I see as the future for, for official immunity? Well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that there is a growing chorus of criticism, um, uh, both uh, on the judicial and the legislative side. It's increasingly clear that the doctrine of qualified immunity in particular is historically baseless. It doesn't have a shred of originalist credibility, which is good if you're trying to get to the Supreme Court. Um, it's empirically basis, so the rationales that have been offered both for qualified immunity and absolute prosecutorial immunity are completely baseless and bankrupt, and you can show that. Uh, things, for example, like, well, there's, you know, if we can't hold a prosecutor liable uh, in a civil rights lawsuit, there's other ways of accountability. Guess what? No, there's not. Um, and, and increasingly, it's just clearly uh, a bad policy, just on the ground. So um, there's this growing chorus of recognition, like we're talking about today, that these doctrines should be repealed. Um, the bad news is that the law enforcement lobby is extraordinary power, extraordinarily powerful, probably the second or third strongest lobby in the country. And they're really, I don't think there's a single policy they care more about than this one than assuring the absolute minimum amount of accountability um, possible. They are strongly attached to the doctrines of qualified immunity, absolute prosecutorial immunity, the Monell doctrine, which eliminates the common law doctrine of respondeat superior. And so it's a really close call, I think, um, in, in the contest that is emerging between law enforcement's commitment to maintaining the policy of near zero accountability that, that has evolved versus this growing recognition um, that the policy is both uh, a disaster for people, for ordinary people on the ground, um, and utterly uh, baseless and intellectually indefensible. How's that going to shake out? I don't know. Stay, stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Um, I appreciate the chance to be here with these other incredible panelists. Um, I'm Katie Chambly Ryan from Civil Rights Corps. Um, I just want to talk, I want to focus in particular on some of the kind of the lessons about what absolute and qualified immunity do in actual cases and kind of how they play on the ground when you're deciding. As, as an impact litigator, which is what we focus on, we, we decide kind of what case to bring 
who to target, what kind of behavior should we be looking at, what do we prioritize, sort of where do we put our organizational resources. And these doctrines, both at our organization and others, have played a huge role in making those decisions. And I want to give you an example of how that's played out in this um, case we've done in New Orleans, where we have decided to sue individual prosecutors, even though you have these really, really um, difficult doctors to contend with. So um, in our lawsuit against the New Orleans DA, it's called Singleton versus Canizero. Th th this is the basic subject matter of the case. So the prosecutor's office in New Orleans was using fake subpoenas. So normally a subpoena would be signed by a judge saying you have to come to court at this time. These prosecutors didn't want to do that. They wanted to get witnesses to come speak to them in their offices by themselves. Um, my guess is that part of it, part of the benefit of this is that the defense lawyer won't know that the conversation ever happened. So there's kind of a Brady um, element to the, to the case as well. Um, but they wanted to have private, off-the-record conversations with victims and witnesses. A lot of times, once they get those victims and witnesses in conversations with them in their offices, what they would do is pressure them to give details that the witness didn't actually remember, even change or alter their testimony, say something that they didn't think was true, threaten them with arrest and other consequences, threaten them with obstruction charges, do a lot of things that if the defense knew about it, the defense would really be able to impeach this witness. But they were able to get these victims and witnesses into these meetings by starting off by threatening them with these things, by these, with these fake subpoenas, saying if you don't come to my office and meet with me by yourself, um, you can be sent to jail. Now, when the fake subpoenas were officially revealed, there were kind of two sentiments out there. One was, um, and, and the public was sort of like, well, there's gonna be no consequences for these guys for having done this. The other thing that kind of came out of the prosecutor's office was they said, well, we did it, it was a formalistic problem, it doesn't really matter, sort of ignoring everything I just said. And of course, we never, even though the subpoenas threatened people with jail, we never actually jailed anybody. Turns out though, they did. Um, when we looked into it, they had used another mechanism called the material witness warrant, which is a way that you can get victims and witnesses who uh, refuse to show up in court, even usually even after getting valid subpoenas, um, you can actually have them arrested and jailed. So prosecutors were using these extremely liberally in New Orleans, and they were actually filing material witness warrants based explicitly on fake subpoenas, on people's non-compliance with totally fake subpoenas. In fact, in one case I found on my first day down there investigating, there was a fake subpoena attached to the material witness warrant application. And these judges are acting in such a rapid fire fashion, the courts are so overwhelmed. A lot of the way they work is just kind of an understanding between the prosecutor and the judge, where the judges, a lot of whom are former prosecutors, just take the prosecutor at their word and they're like, all right, sure, rubber stamp, this person's getting arrested. They were also doing material witness warrants for other invalid reasons. So um, because people had refused to speak to prosecutors, a lot of times that was the sole basis. The witness won't talk to a prosecutor. Well, you actually, you know, in our case, we've said you have a First Amendment right to decide whether or not you're going to speak to a prosecutor. That's compelled speech. You can't make someone go talk to a prosecutor. Um, but even so, they were filing material witness warrants and actually having people arrested just for not going and speaking to prosecutors. They were also filing material witness warrants just because it was kind of hard to find a witness or they thought it might be hard. Maybe they hadn't even tried because the witness was poor or had an unstable life circumstance. So for example, in one material witness uh, warrant, they said this witness is traumatized because she's a child sexual abuse victim and um, she's actually an undocumented person. So she doesn't have a stable home and it'll be very difficult to serve her with a subpoena. Um, they had not made any robust effort to serve her with a subpoena. They just didn't want to do the work, and so they decided this person should be arrested instead. Now, of course, once you get arrested, you're thrown into this kind of legal black hole because as a victim and witness, unlike, we, are, we already know what happens to criminal defendants. They're all technically entitled to counsel. A lot of times that counsel isn't so good or isn't good enough. There's not resources devoted to that. Victims and witnesses don't even have that. So when you go to jail, you don't have anyone whose job it is to advocate for you. You're kind of on your own. A lot of times you're in jail with other people who you're afraid of, with the defendant who you're being jailed so that you'll testify against them. So it's a really dangerous situation. So anyway, this is what was going on in New Orleans. And we decided to bring the case in two ways. So one was to say, these are policies of the office that came from the top, and so we're gonna sue the office as a whole. That's kind of a whole other line of doctrine. But we also really wanted to sue the individual prosecutors whose names were on these fake subpoenas, whose names were on these material witness warrants, and say, these guys made a decision. They exercised their power. I mean, these are attorneys. If anyone should know this conduct's illegal, it's them. They exercise their power against people who are incredibly vulnerable, often, you know, often people who are victims of crime in a way that's completely reprehensible. If anyone deserves to be held accountable, it's these guys. 
And I just want to give you one example um, of, of one of our named plaintiffs, Ms. Renata Singleton, from our case, just to illustrate how this would play out with any particular person. So Renata Singleton was an accountant at the KIPP New Orleans Charter School System. She had never been arrested. She had no criminal record at all. One night, she was in a domestic dispute with her boyfriend. Um, he was cursing, he was drunk, and he broke her cell phone. He snatched her cell phone out of her hand and broke it. She called the police because her daughter was there. She wanted him out of the house. So they showed up at her house. They got the guy out of there. But it didn't end there. A victim witness advocate from the prosecutor's office called Ms. Singleton and said, OK, we want you to help with the prosecution. She said, actually, I broke up with the guy. I'm not interested in that. I'm really busy. I'm paid by the hour. I have three children. I, I want to just move on. But they wouldn't accept that. So they started sending her fake subpoenas demanding she come to the prosecutor's office and meet with them. Again, this was all during work hours. She didn't have time to do that. She wasn't particularly interested in doing that. And actually, she didn't know the subpoenas were fake, but they hadn't been properly served. They were left on her windshield. So she consulted a friend who was a police officer and said, well, these weren't actually served. You don't have to go. So she didn't go to the prosecutor's office. They then file a material witness warrant based on the fake subpoenas, demanding that um, she be arrested for this. Police officers came to her door while she was there with her kids and tried to arrest her. She managed to convince them to let her come into their office to talk to the prosecutors the next day. So the police officers left. She came to the prosecutor's office the next day. They pushed her to testify against, um, to, or to talk about the incident and talk about her boyfriend. She kept saying she didn't think it was something that should be prosecuted. She'd show up if she was subpoenaed, but she didn't think that her prosecution was warranted. And they arrested her right there in the DA's office. She was held in jail for an entire week. Um, she came to the, um, to the courtroom in an orange jumpsuit and shackled at her hands and feet. He had been released on bail, so he had like a $3,500 bail and came in in his, you know, in his regular clothes off on the street. She had a $100,000 bail, so she was not able to be released. Um, he was then sentenced to a misdemeanor for damaging her property and given um, no jail time. She had served seven days just for being, so, so that's the kind of perverse situation that you had going on there. So we thought, let's do these guys. So the, here's where absolute immunity comes in. So as Osley said, absolute immunity protects prosecutors for anything they do, but it only protects them for things they do in their prosecutorial function. So prosecutors also do a lot of other stuff. They investigate cases, they do administrative tasks, they do managerial tasks. And we thought, okay, this seems investigative. They were using these fake subpoenas and material witness warrants as a tool um, to get information in cases and coerce witnesses. There's another exception to absolute immunity, which says if the prosecutor is doing something that's just wholly outside of what a prosecutor is allowed to do, that's just not even within their powers, it's like ultra virus, then they don't get absolute immunity for that either. And we thought, well, that, that should really apply here too. But we had a lot to contend with. You know, basically making the decision to do this meant that we were going to have a totally different kind of case. Um, so we decided to do it because we were in the heartland of what, if anything should fall outside of immunity, it seems like this conduct should. Um, but some of what that means is that the um, office hired two sets of lawyers. So they had a lawyer representing the office and the prosecutors themselves and, and have pursued that extremely aggressively. We managed to win on absolute immunity in the district court. The district court found that the prosecutors weren't entitled to immunity. But now, instead of getting to do what we're entitled to do once you win a motion to dismiss, which is move on to discovery, now we have to face an immediate appeal in the Fifth Circuit, which means that you know, our case is a lot more complicated and justice gets delayed for our clients and kind of some of the systemic reforms we might want to put in place with our official capacity claims is going to be delayed too. So, Basically, even though we have a case where we're in the, we're in the area of the law where we should be able to win, you know, we're right on the law, um, we think that we're morally right to try to get accountability because if you don't try it here, then where are you ever going to try it? And yet, it really has hamstrung the case in a lot of really important ways. Um, and so, you know, I think when people are deciding whether or not to ever pursue these claims, the doctrine of immunity has this real chilling effect on advocates. I mean, even when we were deciding to do it, a lot of people thought we were crazy to even make the attempt to do it. And the conventional wisdom is it's impossible. So newspaper articles were run when we filed our suit that would say things like, 
these guys are going to have to deal with a doctrine of absolute immunity. There's no way they can overcome it. It's impossible. The conventional wisdom is just so powerful um, that it's difficult to even get people to be interested in these claims. And I mean, to have an office, I think part of it is that like, even though there are little um, openings in the law for bringing cases against prosecutors and police officers, because it's so difficult to do, a lot of places won't even have a unit that's dedicated to doing what we at CRC are trying to do. So we have a, an, a unit in our office that's dedicated to suing prosecutors. I think a lot of times the reaction is kind of like, well, you're never going to be able to sue them. Um, other offices aren't going to dedicate their resources or time uh, to this kind of project because there's kind of an assumption that it would fail. Now, if you read the cases on the doctrine, it seems like we're right and it shouldn't fail. But I do think that that chilling effect is really real. And so those kind of borders around absolute immunity, the areas where you should be able to bring cases are really untested. The law is really undeveloped in that area because so few people are willing to bring the cases. It's going to be even worse for plaintiff's lawyers who are looking for cases that are going to end up with a payout. Um, so the last thing I'll say is just about qualified immunity. I just want to mention one thing. So the doctrine is extremely broad. I I'm curious kind of what the other panelists have to say about this, because this is just something from the practice side that's just driven me crazy. There's like actually a case in the US Supreme Court, Hope v. Pelzer, um, where they were tying prisoners to a hitching post um, in Alabama prison. And the court said, look, all right, nobody had ever done this before. But come on, it's still clearly established that you can't do this. Just because the, the um, defendants were creative in the way that they violated constitutional rights shouldn't exempt them from liability. And you know, even so, I've never seen any other case follow that line of reasoning. And it seems like that's completely forgotten and the courts have completely turned instead to this idea that unless you have a case exactly on point, finding them liable for this exact thing, um, then qualified immunity applies. And so, for example, in our New Orleans case, you know, we talked about Hope B. Pelzer. The, um, you know, the defendants still won qualified immunity on all the claims where they asserted it. And they even won it on substantive due process, where the court had to found their find that their conduct was so crazy that it actually shocked the conscience. She said they were still entitled to qualified immunity because there was no case about fake subpoenas before. I don't really understand why courts keep doing that because you've got a US Supreme Court case that seems to me like it rejects that kind of thinking um, and, and it seems like it's just been like thrown into the wind and that case just like never happened. So I'm curious how these guys think that that's possible. I've been totally baffled by this. Um, so I'll just, I'll just end there. But, um, but basically, um, I think part of the reason these doctrines are bad is it really affects the way that advocates decide what cases to bring, who's going to get representation, and it really impedes the development of the law um, where constitutional violations are concerned, not just even accountability for individual people. The, the, let, me, let me address that Hope versus Peltzer case. Uh, you know, it, it fits in very well here, and it just shows where the Supreme Court is going with this doctrine, I think, more than anything else. Uh, when the court took this turn and said, uh, the question isn't the broad question, probable cause has been the rule for 200 years, uh, excessive force, we know, that we know those standards, free speech. Um, that's not how we judge qualified immunity. We judge it as to whether the officer was on notice that his conduct in this case is prohibited, right? And the best way to do that is if there was a case on all fours, right, that was decided by the Supreme Court five years before, then the officer can't be heard to say he's got qualified immunity, but how many times does that happen, right? Every case is different factually. Uh, but what the court said when they did that was, but there are some cases, right? Um, and Hope versus Peltz was maybe a very good example in which even though this had never been done before, it was so extreme that no reasonable prison official could think you could tie a, uh, a guy in a chain gang uh, in 100 degree weather uh, to a hitching post for eight hours and not give him water, not only give him, not give him water, but have the dogs next to him drinking, right, from, from their bowl, right? Um, uh, that violates the Eighth Amendment. Even with that, you had three dissents on the Supreme Court, right, um, saying it hadn't been addressed. So they, they opened the door a little bit. Hope versus Peltzer, the Supreme Court has not cited, right, <laughs> uh, in, in the last 10 years. And in the last 28 qualified immunity cases before the Supreme Court, the government's won 25 times. In a majority of those, just by per curiam reversals, not, not even with full argument, right? Um, so as much as the history, right, is on our side, uh, that, that, that there was no basis in 1983 to think about this kind of broad immunity, um, it's a larger issue, right? It's this issue of not holding, you know, 
uh, uh, government officials accountable on the notion, I think, that we're going to over-deter, right? Um, now, you still see lower courts sometimes citing Hope versus Pelter and say this was so outrageous, right? Um, even though there was never a case that was litigated like this before, we're not going to give qualified immunity. Uh, but it's, um, it's pretty rare. And, and, and the other point you make, it, it, so really what the court has done here with qualified immunity is redefined the constitutional question across the board, whether it's First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, now every one of those violations is not simply because you acted unreasonably, it's not because you violated somebody's First Amendment rights by, uh, by suppressing, unless you acted deliberately and intentionally, right, um, and knowingly to violate their rights. Um, and so what they've done, they've kind of redefined the constitutional right itself, and, and that may be the most lasting damage that we get with, with, with the, I think, with the Qualified Immunity Doctrine. I, I just take the chance to say that if you really want a snapshot of not just American criminal justice, but of the almost unrelenting pro-government mindset of our federal judiciary, this is a great um, setting because think about the basic rationale for qualified immunity is that you've got the federal judiciary losing sleep over the possibility that somewhere some police officer um, is held civilly liable for conduct that he wasn't clearly on notice was not okay. And let me just say as an aside, um, police officers never pay out of their own pocket when they are held liable. Even the, in the rare times when they are, um, Professor Joanna Schwartz has an article from 2014 where she documents that 99.98% um, of all dollars paid out in police misconduct cases are paid by who? By the employer. Who's that? Us, the taxpayers. We pay those damages. Um, so this, uh, you know, this, this judicial solicitude you know, for the financial well-being of police officers is uh, uh, just a fantasy. Um, but I want to make a different point, and that's this. So you got the federal judiciary losing sleep over the possibility that somewhere some police officer gets held liable, theoretically, um, his employer gets held liable for um, conduct that he wasn't clearly on notice was wrong. Do they show that same solicitude for us, for, for us mere citizens when it's a criminal case and the government prosecutes us for something we didn't even know was on the books? There's 5,000. Is that a rhetorical question? It's not, sir. I know you know the answer to the question. <laughs> um, so um, this is quite stark and it's quite, I think, revealing about the fundamental mindset of our, judi of our judiciary as an entity is that it, that it displays extraordinary solicitude for police officers and prosecutors. But when it's a mere citizen who's facing actual jail time, it goes right out the window and the, court, the judges don't lose any sleep over the possibility that you didn't know the thing that you were you're being prosecuted for was wrong, you still get to go to prison. That in a nutshell is the mindset of our federal judiciary, relentlessly pro-government and not terribly concerned um, with uh, the needs of uh, ordinary citizens or fundamental fairness for ordinary citizens. As long as the government gets a free pass and gets to enjoy this near zero accountability, then everything is fine as far as our federal judiciary is concerned. That's, um, I, I'm frankly, I'm, I'm horrified that we've gotten to that point. That was, never, <laughs> that was never supposed to be this country. In fact, I think we fought a revolution kind of to not be that sort of country, but we're back. I'm actually, uh, so I was actually going to ask a question. Uh, I think, uh, Clark, you alluded to this. One of the, uh, the Supreme Court's justifications for upholding the uh, absolute immunity bar for prosecutors acting in the uh, prosecutorial function uh, is this idea that there's some other avenue for them to be disciplined, right? And specifically, I mean, the general justification is there's this, there are these bar associations that are, we have this guild system that is supposed to discipline prosecutors when they uh, do misconduct. And that doesn't happen, as, as you mentioned. Uh, and so I think actually I have a question from the audience uh, that kind of gets at a solution for somebody who uh, has been wronged in the current regime or, um, or maybe a potential future solution if you imagine something changing in the future. Uh, so if we wanted to end absolute immunity for prosecutors and permit victims of intentional egregious misconduct, uh, to sue the prosecutor's office for misconduct of its prosecutors, how can we best do it? And I think, um, I think Katie, you mentioned an example of something of, of what your office is doing, but I think this might also be a question that could open up to uh, if you see any changes happening in the legal sphere or anything happening in the near future that would make it possible for people to, uh, to actually vindicate their rights when they're wronged by a prosecutor. Um, I don't know. So. Either oh, yeah, of those questions. That's what we want to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I I can speak to kind of the more um, 
yeoman-like answer to that, just based on the current state of the law, which is I think that you've got to bring the cases. I mean, you, you, you have, there's so, conventional wisdom is such a powerful thing, um, even among incredibly smart people who spend all their time in law books, but the kind of idea that um, you're never gonna be able to win a particular type, type of case means that the cases don't get investigated, they don't flesh out what actually happened, which means you're not filing public records requests about that case, you're not getting discovery in that case. And so all these things stop advocates from bringing the cases at all. I think you know where there is room to bring them, I think you've got to have uh, people litigating them. Unfortunately, that's really difficult to say for people who are in private practice and need to actually make money off their cases. I would love to see more nonprofit organizations willing to bring cases um, that would challenge prosecutors for conduct that falls outside the scope of of um, absolute immunity, just because there is so much investigative, managerial, and ultra-virus conduct that prosecutors engage in. And so I'd like to see those cases at least investigated and brought to light. I tend to think that there's value. I mean, maybe it's because they came from the death penalty world where you have to kind of redefine victory and you, your job is basically losing in complicated ways in front of as many courts as possible. But um, I do think that there's power to kind of the, the str strength of litigation as a tool to bring something to light. Um, and, and put something before the courts and sort of uh, force debate on it. When you do it, you have to come at the case in the most rigorous way possible. I, I tend to think um, investigation can sometimes be undervalued in these cases because there's kind of a hesitancy to put um, a ton of resources into something that you think is gonna fail. But um, a lot of times, I mean, what we were unable to unearth in this case in New Orleans was just incredible. And investigating other cases around the country, I mean, you don't have to dig that hard to start finding some insane levels of misconduct. So I, I went to one jurisdiction, which I won't name, but you know, just for example, the police officers um, use body cams. They have a room where they do interrogations and they have a sign on the door of the room that I have a photo of that says, please turn your body cam off before entering the interrogation room, like to ensure that interrogations aren't videotaped. Um, that's, that's incredibly shady, but I mean, there are things like this all over the place and, and it really takes somebody being motivated to investigate them. So I think you have to kind of push these edges and try to enforce these rights anyway. Um, and in doing so, you hope that you chip away at those bigger doctrines. Now there's other people with much larger scale plans to kind of overturn the doctrines. So I'll, I can turn to one of those people, it seems like, at least maybe two of those people. So, you know, I, I, I think it is important to, to try to litigate, you know, at the margins, right, where right. we can with prosecutor immunity. Uh, we, we've got an interesting case going, actually. We just got a good opinion from a district judge in Pennsylvania, an, an exoneration case, who guy spent 28 years in prison. It turned out there wasn't Brady material that was turned over uh, by the prosecutors and the, uh, and the police. And, of course, the prosecutors said uh, absolute immunity. Um, uh, we argued that the judge had ordered during the trial, the course of the trial, both under the discovery rules and under Brady, they had ordered the prosecutor to turn everything over to the defense. Um, turned out they didn't. Um, we argue that's outside a prosecutor's discretion at this point. It's one thing you, for a prosecutor to make the Brady decision. That's the kind of classic case of prosecutorial immunity. It's something due during the trial, right? It's, uh, it's discretionary and maybe you're, you make a wrong judgment. Um, here we said they didn't have a choice, right? Uh, pro the judge said these documents, these types of documents, including forensic reports, which weren't turned over, um, uh, turned them over. They weren't. Um, and uh, on a civil suit, uh, at least at the district court level, the judges ruled that we can go ahead uh, with, with, the, with that claim. So, you know, there, there was some inroad there, but it, it's still, you know, we're talking about the margins. And, and what would be best, but I, I, I don't hold that much hope for it, is it's one thing 30 years ago, 40 years ago, for the Supreme Court to have assumed when they first had to decide prosecutorial immunity and say, well, you know, it's gonna lead to a lot of frivolous lawsuits. Um, uh, we, we want to avoid that. It'll deter prosecutors from doing things because they think they're gonna be sued. And by the way, there are all these other remedies, right? Uh, there'll be internal investigations in the office. There can be bar investigations. There can be criminal investigations if something is really uh, awkward. Empirically, it hasn't happened, right? I mean, uh, you know, but I don't think this Supreme Court, even if you could mount an empirical challenge, and we had all that data now, uh, how many prosecutors have actually been, <laughs> right, um, uh, sanctioned uh, by uh, associations? We've had one prosecutor who's been a week in jail in Texas, right? That's the only prosecution I know of uh, in, in, in many years. Uh, notwithstanding, when you look at all the exoneration cases, an enormous amount of prosecutorial right, misconduct. Uh, 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 that caused those harms. 
uh, you'd think a court that was open to empirical information would say, well, maybe we ought to rethink this, this you know, this calibration here. Um, I don't think this court's about to do it. I, I have kind of two proposals. One's um, more modest and maybe even serious, and the other one is uh, a little more aggressive. Um, maybe it's not time for it yet, but I think, I think frankly, we need to be working on multiple lines. Um, I mentioned civil forfeiture earlier, and something very interesting happened in civil forfeiture, and that is that it went from um, a, a policy that was getting virtually no attention and that was uh, just infested with terrible abuses to, I would say over the course of the last six to eight years, uh, there's been more positive movement on civil forfeiture than any other policy I've ever seen. I think the number of cases of states now that have either partially or wholly eliminated civil forfeiture is like 14 or 15. Um, the uh, the head of the IRS was called on the carpet in front of a, a congressional subcommittee and forced to apologize for some civil forfeiture victims um, because of the way his office had conducted some forfeitures. So there's, there's been movement there. Um, and it seems to me that the magic formula for civil forfeiture reform um, should be replicated for prosecutorial Im uh, immunity or, or prosecutorial accountability, and that is um, come up with, with sound policy proposals that are incremental. Don't try to win the whole thing at once because you can't do it. Um, but come up with a proposal that's just so reasonable on its face, like you should be able to sue a prosecutor whose misconduct caused um, a false conviction in a case where the defendant has subsequently been exonerated and there's been already a judicial finding in that proceeding of prosecutorial misconduct and you could, you could imagine a bill that simply says, okay, well, that prosecutor or that office should be subject to civil liability. Who on earth, well, besides a prosecutor, who on earth besides a prosecutor could say to that bill, well, that doesn't seem reasonable, right? That's, that's ridiculous. So um, you could push that, and then what you, what you, you, you push it, and what you realize is you're going to run into extraordinary resistance, and you're waiting for a particular thing to happen. And this is how this was the key to civil forfeiture reform. What you're waiting for is for a particularly horrific example to happen in a jurisdiction where you've already got that bill that's been kind of percolating for a little while. The horrific thing happens. You pick up a sponsor for that bill, and nobody wants to oppose that bill with the with the living memory, you know, just a, a, an incident that's a few weeks or a few months old of, of this horrific thing that happened and that needs to be, that, that, that this bill will address, that's how you get legislation passed. So that's my serious proposal. My more aggressive proposal is what I call the Kaiser Soze plan for prosecutorial uh, immunity. For those of you who've seen the usual suspects, he's the, 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 the um, global, transnational criminal who's so scary that bad guys uh, lose sleep thinking about meeting Kaiser Soze, and that is, um, this would take advantage of another um, opportunity that presents here, which is that prosecutors are utterly complacent about this. They're utterly complacent in most jurisdictions about committing violations because they know to a high degree of certainty they'll get away with it. We should change that. And how would we do that? Well, one way would be to create a kind of a reporting system so that uh, these, you know, kind of beleaguered public defenders that don't have the resources to push back very hard could report when they're involved in a case where there is significant prosecutorial misconduct. And then what I'd do if I you know, sort of had the funds to throw around, I want to get a lot of utility out of a certain amount of money, is I would create like a prosecutorial accountability A-team. And I would parachute those guys into a particularly egregious case, and I would tell them, I'm, I'm paying bonuses for scalps. If you guys come back with disbarred prosecutors, you're going to be very, uh, you're going to do very well this year. Um, and turn the, turn the forces of the market loose on the situation. Uh, and it's not that I think you're going to be able to, to catch or, or hold accountable most of the misbehaving prosecutors. What I really want is for all prosecutors who know that they are engaged in misconduct to, be, to have a hard time getting to sleep at night because they might wait, meet the A-team tomorrow morning. That's how you begin to change conduct, um, is by, is by ma making them no longer so confident that they can absolutely get away with this. Because right now, they are perfectly confident that they can get away with this, and they are right. We should change that by any means necessary. Well, maybe that's a little far. Yeah, no, by any means necessary. <laughs> so I have a bit of a follow-up question. I think you brought up the, the civil asset forfeiture issue. And I think actually, I mean, Civil Rights Corps has been central to this too, but the kind of bail conversation has changed very rapidly in recent years too. And uh, there's much more of a consensus that there's a problem with money bail, which I think maybe 10 years ago even was not so much on the table in the, conversa in the legal conversation. And so I, I guess I wonder, I think, I mean, I think this question is kind of getting at how do you make the um, prosecutorial immunity that issue, or do you see that happening now? Is that like, how do we get to the place where we really are putting pressure on the judiciary to change the way they decide these cases? Because, as you mentioned, Clark, it's so at odds with, I think, what the public uh, understands the role. Like, 
what I think the public would argue is what most people believe, other than maybe judges and prosecutors, uh, should be the accountability system for prosecutors. Man, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. You're sort of like asking for the cure for polio or something. Yeah, I'm it's not a hard sure question. we're there, but no, listen, I think, I think we, um, so here's another piece of good news. Um, I, I, have, I do a lot of public speaking, and I talk about this from time to time. Um, I've never been in front of just an ordinary group of people, meaning like people who are not uh, full-time law enforcement professionals, in, in front of any other group of people. The, the prospect that a, that a prosecutor who engages in deliberate, willful misconduct, like withholding, deliberately withholding uh, Brady material, uh, materially favorable evidence to the defense, should escape any civil liability is flabbergasting to people. They can't even get their minds around it. Um, and then when you tell them that, that, that it wasn't even something that you know, Congress came up with, that it's the Supreme Court literally inventing uh, a, 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 you know, immunity that doesn't even appear in the relevant statute, that makes them even more you know, kind of incre incredulous. So I, I really think you know, um, if, you can, if we can pick the right context in which to force people who think that policy is the right policy to defend it on the merits, because it doesn't have any merits, ordinary people are just absolutely flabbergasted by this policy. So if we can, put, if we can create a situation uh, where we're having a kind of a national discussion about it. That is hard to do, though, because this is not really uppermost in most people's minds. But, you know, I, who knows what it could take. Maybe, you know, I, if Morgan Freeman starred in the right movie about this topic, and, or, or, you know, and Oprah Winfrey had him on her show or something, or whoever, whoever it is that's now sort of the, you know, the, 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 the cultural, um, you know, uh, gatekeepers for what we should be talking about, that, I think, is what it would take. But the good news is if we can get the conversation going, um, there is no way to defend this policy on the merits. There is no way to defend this policy on the merits. No person who's not a prosecutor thinks this is a good idea. That's, that's, that's some reason for optimism. Yeah. I mean, you, your point is right. A lot of this is below the radar screen for most people, right? Um, uh, you know, we're in tune with what the Supreme Court's doing in terms of door closing generally, right? Um, and we write law review articles and talk among ourselves and, you know, have those debates. Uh, for most people, right, it, it, it's just not an issue that, that, that they ever see, right, unless they have some case that, that they were involved in. And so how do you elevate it to like the civil forfeiture? Right, the civil forfeiture took off. Um, uh, we got the media involved, we, 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 we got these horrific incidents, but we also had a lot of people who were affected. By it, right? I mean, there were hundreds, thousands of people. Uh, the litigation in Philadelphia, which we know we've done, um, you know, thousands of people lost, you know, property in their homes, no due process, and once that hit, um, you got that kind of change. Um, you know, the other way to think about this is now, we've been on the last panel with progressive prosecutors, um, you know, prosecutors who now in their office, right, will take this seriously, um, uh, not only in terms of training, right, uh, but in terms of their own supervision of their own officers, you know, um, you know, and create models, right, in their, in their own offices um, for, it doesn't mean we'll get civil suits, but, you know, I'd rather head it off <laughs> uh, at the operational stage than have to rely on the courts to give us remedies. Um, that there are other ways of thinking of building in uh, in the systems. In the same way, I think with internal affairs of police departments, my own view is lawsuits are good, they're important, um, they're after the fact. Um, it's much more important to have these institutions take that problem seriously themselves uh, and do the sanctioning internally, right? Um, uh, you know, we need all the, the backup as well. Um, so th 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 there may be models, right, that, that, that created, because, you know, most of the people who've now been running on progressive platforms have made this an issue, right? Um, uh, you know, we've got Brady violations in our office. We've got other things that have gone on. I'm going to change that. How are you going to change it? I think that's such an important point, the fact that, well, a lot of the people who are the most affected by prosecutor misconduct are not being affected by the kinds of stuff we're seeing in New Orleans, which is kind of your banner, most splashy examples of prosecutor misconduct. Some of the most egregious things that I think are going on in prosecutors' offices is just the, the sheer laziness and shallowness involved in investigations in prosecutors' offices. I mean, people are, prosecutors have these enormous caseloads in a lot of places. They're bringing cases, felony charges that they haven't even investigated. They're opening the file on the first day when they stand there in court, asking for a big bail amount, and then throwing somebody's life into complete turmoil. Um, once a prosecution's initiated, against someone, even if they manage to escape it, which they probably won't, you know, um, uh, as, you, as you heard, it'll probably result in a plea just to get this person out from under this burden. But I mean, it, that makes it hard for the person to find a job that takes away time where they could be at the job. Um, it could affect their parental rights. I mean, there's a lot of things that come with being prosecuted. And the level of care that goes into it is so low. Um, there's a US Supreme Court case called Kyle C. Whiteley that says that prosecutors are responsible not only for the information that's in their hands, they have to turn over not only that exculpatory information, 
but information from the whole prosecution team, and that includes what the police know. So I don't really understand how prosecutors could be complying with Kyle's when they don't even understand the underlying facts of the cases that they're prosecuting, and yet that happens every single day. Um, and I don't know if, even if we dismantle absolute immunity, if we would be able to get individual prosecutors for that, or if that's the way to attack that problem. I mean, the, the thing that's really ruining people's lives is some of this more pedestrian stuff. Um, I mean, I think it's important to hold people accountable when you've got the most egregious examples, because that stuff is happening. But you're right, that stuff's on the margins. Um, some, some of the really core concerns, I think, have to be attacked in lots of different ways. I mean, one of the litigation tools we have is to kind of bring lawsuits against the office as a whole. Those have their own challenges. Um, but I think, you know, there's investigation and remedies that you can get in those cases that's, that's really useful. But, um, but I, I don't even know if eliminating immunity would resolve some of the things that, s some of the most quotidian things going on in prosecutors' offices that just destroy people's lives. And so this is a question that I think it might be primarily for Katie, but also for David and uh, even for Clark. Uh, I think, uh, how do you weigh the risk of making bad law when you select a case? Uh, and this kind of gets at what I think the Supreme Court closing the door and the, what the current <coughs> landscape is, but, but um, how do you do that? Uh, I think it's really difficult. Whenever you're bringing a case with kind of novel facts or we are trying to push the law, which is a lot of what we're doing in impact litigation, you're risking making bad law. Um, so I think there's a few ways you could do it. I mean, one thing is, in my view, there's a difference between bringing a case in a district court and then deciding to appeal a case. And then there's a difference even between deciding to appeal a case and trying to like seek cert on the case, the US Supreme Court. So I mean, I think obviously you want to be the most strategic in the cases where you actually try to get it for the US Supreme Court. You don't want to bring just any old case up um, or maybe any case up with the current court. Um, depending on kind of your circumstance. I think the same thing kind of applies to appeals. You have to think carefully about that. Um, in terms of kind of bringing the case, I think, you know, you want to just have, you have to just use your judgment on kind of when you have a justifiable theory. And then I think you just have to do the most robust litigation that you possibly can. Um, bring the best and just try to create the most powerful vehicle for the um, for the law that you're trying to, to create or build upon that you possibly can. And there's not always a guarantee, but a lot of times, you know, in the areas where we're litigating at Civil Rights Corps, both on bail and now, you know, in qualified immunity things, on holding prosecutors' offices accountable as a whole, the law is already so bad. Um, it's hard to imagine how we're gonna make it worse. Um, it's still really terrifying, the, the idea of making bad law. Um, but um, I think that can sometimes be so crippling that the cases never get investigated, they never get brought, and the legal theories aren't ever tested and developed in the courts. So a lot of times you just have um, law that's really thin. And actually, like, it's interesting, even though there's a lot of cases that they try to bring against um, individual officers in the qualified immunity sphere, one thing that always really strikes me is how vague what clearly established means is. As we were just talking about, there's kind of the Hope v. Pelzer idea on one pole, and then there's this idea that there needs to be this exact case on point on the other, and no one's ever really cleared up what the actual standard is. And I think there's a lot of places in the law where you've just got this really undeveloped, mushy law where nobody really knows what's going on at all. Uh, maybe sometimes we wanna leave it mushy because we think if someone had a chance to clear it up, they would clear it up in a way that's really terrible. Um, I'm sure that the current court would leap at the opportunity to do that in many areas, but um, in some places I think you know there's real missed opportunities where there's actually kind of windows to bring the law forward, at least in the lower courts, that um, people aren't willing to take because they're afraid of making bad law. So it's a balance and um, nobody knows the answer, but that's, that's the, the closest I can come on just kind of how I and other people at my office try to make that determination, but it's, it's really hard. I mean, I, you know, I spent 17 years as a, uh, uh, doing strategic libertarian civil rights litigation in the Institute for Justice. I mean, I, I, I focused on occupational licensing cases, and when we, we first started litigating that, people said, that's insane, you can't win those cases. Um, and we did, we won some of them, we lost more than we won, but it's, uh, you know, it, you're right, like there are some areas of law, you, it, like it can't get worse. It's just like, I mean, maybe sort of asymptotically, you, if you could find, come up with a sufficiently precise you know, uh, device like a, a constitutional electron microscope, you could see the axis, you know, the, your curve get closer to the axis, but like, no, there's just, um, on, in some doctrines uh, or some areas, you can't get worse. Um, I'd add one other thing too, and that is to say that um, litigation is a, especially civil rights litigation, is a really fluid process, and um, it's more chaotic. It's more like the butterfly flapping its wings in China, you know, than it is playing chess or something like that. And I'll just give you one concrete example. 
Um, I was involved in the, the Kelo eminent domain litigation that some of you may uh, know about. My the Institute for Justice litigated that. I was on the trial team. Uh, and, you know, that was a case uh, that presented the question of whether the public use provision of the Fifth Amendment um, prohibits the government from taking property for pure economic development purposes, literally taking a bunch of homes from poor people, bulldozing them to build homes for rich people. That's what was going on in that case. Um, and our position was that's, that the Constitution, that's not a public use, so you can't do that. By a five to four decision, the Supreme Court rejected that argument, upheld the use of eminent domain for pure economic development. So yeah, you can bulldoze a bunch of poor people's houses to build houses for rich people. Why? Because maybe it'll increase the tax base. That looks pretty horrible. Well, guess what? That came to be one of the most reviled decisions uh, from the Supreme Court in modern uh, memory. And, and I'm talking about like across the political spectrum. And at last count, something like 43 or 44 states had changed their laws in response to the Kelo decision, either at the constitutional level or statutorily. Now, that went all the way from really substantive changes like you got in Florida that completely and radically changed the use of eminent domain in that state to just pure window dressing. Uh, but, but by and large, the, the sort of the act of losing the Kelo case in the U.S. Supreme Court almost certainly made the, the world or, or, or the sort of the actual um, uh, practical effect of eminent domain in America um, better, not worse, or at least to change the legal environment for the better. So the point is you, you, you really can't know exactly where um, things are going to go when you initiate a lawsuit. If you're convinced that you're right and you have some non-frivolous arguments to make, there are very few settings in which I think the argument that you might make the law worse is a compelling one or a sufficiently compelling one to not challenge the injustice. Yeah, and important to remember also that the immunity doctrine does not apply to injunctive actions. We're only talking about immunity from damage claims. Um, uh, Supreme Court's done enough damage with <laughs> injunctive actions and class actions. Anyway, they've limited that. But, but to the extent you talked about bail, you talked about civil forfeiture, right, where we've seen some significant changes, right, and we're seeing it now, um, uh, it's because lawyers are now litigating those as injunctive actions, right, trying to change the system, right, as opposed to saying you're now responsible, you know, financially for what, what, what went wrong before. Um, and, and, of course, the, the nice thing about that process is we get to write the narrative, right? Uh, we're writing the complaint. We're raising it, whether it's civil forfeiture or bail, uh, and, and able to use all the data we have, empirical and otherwise, right, and all the horror stories uh, to, to kind of create that kind of change. So it's... Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, as I said, when you, that's why I said you've got to look at the whole scheme of remedies out there. It's not just damage actions. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court's made it fairly difficult even to get injunctions, right? There are standing issues. There are uh, questions about who you can sue, Bivens actions, you know, and, and so on in, in, in federal court. But, but there, there are openings there, right? Um, and, and I think that's so. And, and sure, can, can you lose those? Can you make some bad law? But, but <laughs> the situation is bad anyway. I mean, if you've got, a, if you've got an unconstitutional bail system, I'm not so concerned if I litigate it, some court's going to say it's okay. I mean, we live with it anyway, right? So, uh, but I, I think we've got to be kind of um, uh, very careful um, and strategic about, you know, where we go. And your point, I think, is if we're in tune where, with where the American public is, uh, then you start to see judges acting differently, right? I mean, the, the forfeiture case we had in Philadelphia before a fairly conservative uh, federal judge, um, as you know, kind of uh, ruled our way on virtually every issue. Um, there was a sense that something was broken, right, um, in, in that system. So um, I, I think we ought to think about those alternative remedies as well. Just to respond to what both of you said, um, that is such an important point about the injunctive, um, the injunctive claims. And one, one thing that we've done in our cases um, when we're suing prosecutors, one kind of strategy that we've taken on is to have kind of a patchwork approach. So we'll have conduct challenged in a few different ways. So we'll have kind of your damages claims against individual prosecutors, you've got your official capacity, you know, your Monell claims against the whole system, you've got damages and injunctive on everything. So ideally, somehow, you can like squeeze out a win on one of them. They all have their barriers, um, but it's kind of like, you know, like the Death Star, like there's that one little chink that you can fly <laughs> into if you like. So I guess this way we're just like flying like a bunch of little things, but, um, but, but usually we kind of have a patchwork of different things so that at least somehow we can get the two things we usually want are we want like a real ruling on the law, not just on like whether there's immunity, but like a real ruling, somebody just saying, you can't do this. Um, so we hope, you know, but with one of those tacks, we can get there. And then the second thing that um, at least I really want is discovery, um, an opportunity to unearth things that are going on and kind of bring that to light. Because then, you know, even if you lose the case, you can shed the light, you know, the public. It's one of the most powerful tools you have to kind of shed light on what's going on and, and on a practice. 
Um, and in New Orleans, I mean, one thing that's really exciting about the case is that because you know, we have eight official capacity claims moving forward, and I think seven against individuals, some of them are injunctive, some of them are for damages, but because of that, we're going to get to do this investigation, this deep investigation, you know, with subpoenas, and real subpoenas, and um, court-ordered mechanisms of a contemporary DA's office. So a lot of times when you're suing a DA's office, you're suing them for something that happened 20 years ago. You got wrongfully convicted. It takes that long for that to get overturned. <laughs> then you get to sue about it. So, but we're actually going to get to investigate what's going on in the office right now. Um, and I don't know that there's been an opportunity for anyone to do that. And so there's power in that, you know, no, no matter what kind of the ultimate outcome of the case. And then just to respond to your point about um, kind of the winning by losing, I, I tend to think that's really powerful. Again, this is probably a relic of my time in death penalty where we had to like console ourselves that we were winning by losing. But, um, but I really think it's true. I mean, at, at worst, if we lost the case on the individual prosecutors in New Orleans, it's an opportunity to say, look how egregious this misconduct is. They can't be held liable for that. That's an opportunity to get the public really angry about it and maybe build up some of these other mechanisms outside the judicial system or you know, kind of increase people's sense that there's a need to change this particular law. And then the last thing I'll just say is that I totally agree with you, litigation, you have no idea really where it's gonna go. You're taking your best guess. Just because my particular skills are being a litigation bot does not mean that litigation is the solution to all the problems. And so I think as a litigator in the impact world, you just have to constantly try to work with organizers and policymakers and legislators and people on the ground who are kind of building out a much broader system than what you are and try to understand how you fit in. Because you're not gonna be able to solve all the problems just through litigation. So um, even though um, I really enjoy it on like a nerdy level, I don't convince myself that it's kind of the one and only solution to our problems. It's just what I happen to really like to do and be good at. Um, so this is a, actually, I'm not, so, is, so are there any other organizations that are doing the kind of work that uh, Civil Rights Corps is doing? Or are there, are there any, or do you know of any other litigation that, like the one that you're, like the litigation you're bringing in Maricopa County or New Orleans? Um, other offices that are suing prosecutors' offices? Yes. Or, so the ACLU has a branch. Um, there are partners on um, the Singleton v. Canizero case, and so they're co-counsel with us, so they're bringing prosecutor cases. They also have a suit, a misconduct-based suit, um, in Orange County, California. So they're bringing cases, but a lot of places, I mean, Newfeld Check is a great office that brings a lot of misconduct cases, tons of misconduct cases. They are experts on immunity and qualified immunity stuff. So there's a lot of people bringing the individual claims. Um, I would like to see kind of like more robust systemic things going on. The Prosecutor Project and Civil Rights Corps and the ACLU's project both started a little less than two years ago. So I think there's a lot of kind of unmined potential there. Um, I have this big um, crazy list in my office of all these kinds of cases that we could try bringing, some of which we'll probably lose and maybe some of which we'll win. But um, right now, you know, there's just, it's so unmined. There's so much potential for what you could do in that space that I hope more organizations will start doing it. Um, I want to add something that's maybe not <clears throat> intuitively obvious, uh, but I think is a really important piece of all of this, and that is, um, I think that we need to increase the number of criminal trials that we have in our system for a number of reasons, uh, both because that's the constitutionally prescribed mechanism for resolving um, criminal charges, which is not insignificant, um, but also because um, so many cases don't go the full distance, and so we don't find out what was in the prosecutor's files, mm -hmm. what tactics they used, what was going on behind the scenes. Um, and we've seen some really spectacular flameouts from DOJ uh, and all prosecutors' offices, but including from DOJ. Um, there was the case, some of you may be familiar with the Cliven Bundy case up in Nevada. This is the family that was grazing their cattle on federal land, and then they were supposed to not do that anymore, and there's a big confrontation with the feds. And, you know, they're not super sympathetic people. That case should have been a slam dunk for the feds, and it wasn't. It was actually dismissed during the trial with prejudice, so that they can't bring charges again. Why? Because the prosecutors in that case were lying and cheating and failing to disclose. Now, here's an interesting, not interesting, here's a, here's a really key question. How often would that happen if, if even 50% of criminal prosecutions went the full distance. How many of them would blow up in DOJ's face because of prosecutorial misconduct? Um, and how much better um, uh, would our perception of the true nature of the system be if we had an opportunity to see that? So we don't have an opportunity to see how many cases would flame out. Why? Because the prosecu prosecutors in this country are equipped with such a, such a fearsome array of tools to pressure people into pleading guilty early on before the public has a chance to find out what misconduct they may already have engaged in 
and perhaps more importantly, what misconduct they are prepared to engage in down the road in order to get that conviction. That's the thing, I think, one of the things that should absolutely be haunting all of us and keeping all of us up at night. Um, the vast majority of our giant criminal justice behemoth is, is, under, is under the radar. It's, 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 it's not visible to us. Most of America's criminal justice system and, and the adjudicative process unfolds in complete darkness, and that should terrify you. Well, I mean, I think it probably does. It should terrify the people who aren't in this room who should, you should tell them about them, and then they should be terrified. Uh, so uh, I have one follow-up question for you, and then I want to, uh, we have about five minutes, so I wanted to give everybody a last chance to say whatever their concluding thoughts are. Is, uh, um, how do we, how do we bring, get people to bring more trials? How do, we, how do we get to that place? I know it's a big question. I just if you have any thoughts. Yeah, well, we actually have, a, uh, Cato has a, um, uh, a strategic uh, campaign going on that. Um, our theory basically, so there's basically two problems, two things, two dynamics that are that have essentially virtually killed off the criminal jury trial. The first is coercive plea bargaining. And uh, we don't have to get further into that here because it's, I think most people are, understand why it has become coercive and how. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize is the systemic devaluing of the criminal jury trial as an institution. Uh, Professor Akhil Amar at Yale Law School said that the, today's jury is a pale shadow of its former self, and he's absolutely right. And here's the, very, the essence of it as far as I'm concerned. Um, today, judges and prosecutors have succeeded in perpetrating um, a, a myth about the criminal jury, uh, which is that the only thing it's supposed to do is empirical, just help determine what the facts of the case are. Did, does that substance contain drugs and did that person possess it and they have no other role? That is completely antithetical to the understanding of what the, of the role of, of criminal juries in our system of government for more than a thousand years and also at the time of the framing when the understanding of the role was yes, they have an empirical function, but they also have an avowedly government checking and injustice preventing function. Um, sometimes referred to as jury nullification. I don't like that term because I don't think it's precise and it's also pejorative. What we're really talking about is conscientious acquittal. We're talking about the jury saying, you know what? You have proven this person's factual guilt, but, but I don't believe this prosecution is just, either because they don't deserve to be punished or increasingly in our system, because the punishment you propose to inflict on them is unjust. This mandatory minimum is completely disproportionate to the nature of the wrong. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but judges and prosecutors work incredibly hard to make sure that juries are ignorant of what punishment the government proposes to impose on, on the defendant. Um, and they do it because I think in many cases they realize they cannot make the moral case for their own prosecution. They live in fear of a jury engaging in conscientious acquittal because they know they can't make the case that this, this defendant deserves to go away for 20 or 30 years or life. And that if the jury knew that was what was gonna happen, they would want no part of it and they would refuse to convict. So what we're trying to do essentially is to, is to put together a strategic campaign to, to essentially um, bring back this founding era understanding of the true role of the jury, which is that the jury should know what the government's trying to do to the defendant. And they should be told that they can decide to acquit if they think that is unjust. Um, because so many prosecutions in our system are palpably unjust. Um, and if prosecutors knew they had to go in front of a jury, that they had to convince not only of the defendant's factual guilt, but also of the moral justness of what the government proposes to do upon conviction, that they would lose a lot of cases and plea offers would get better, and more defendants would feel more comfortable about exercising their right to a, to a jury trial, and it would completely transform our system. So um, I think that that is, if I had to just prescribe one thing or say that there's one thing I think we could change, it's to go back to the constitutionally prescribed mechanism for adjudicating criminal charges in this case, the one that we have practically killed off through coercive plea bargaining um, and jury neutering. Um, it's not an easy lift, but that's where I think uh, true reform may lie. Yeah, Talk about moving mountains. Um, <laughs> a lot there, and, and, and I agree with a lot of it. I, 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 on the other hand, kind of progressive steps and so on. Um, uh, at, at a minimum, uh, what we ought to be achieving, right, in the criminal justice system, putting aside all this immunity issue, which is a different issue, uh, is we, we live in a system with a lot of plea bargaining. Uh, we probably will for the future. Um, to ensure equal right resources there, uh, to make sure that once that plea is entered, I, I'm not to I do a lot of criminal defense work. I'm not against plea bargaining. If both sides have investigative powers, if both sides know exactly what's in the, each other's files to the extent that has to be disclosed, uh, you've got the resources to look at it. Um, uh, it's not unusual that a prosecutor and a defense lawyer can say, you know, here's a fair resolution of this case. Um, uh, obviously, some will go to jury, uh, but but you know we're, we're not even at the, you know so we're we're not even at that point, right? Because so many cases get played out before the defense lawyer or the defendant even begins to know what the prosecutor has and and, and all the stuff down 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 the line. So uh, there there are movements here, and 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 to 
and to get the Supreme Court to change the rule about informing juries about what the penalty is and right and, and allowing them to exercise kind of a moral judgment over it, I'd love it, but I don't think we're going to see that too soon. <laughs> we propose to do it unilaterally. You and I can talk about it. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Katie, do you have any thought, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, I don't know if I have a good solution to any of that, but um, I do think the fact that so much is resolved by plea bargains is an incredible problem, but it's made worse, a, a worse problem, kind of what you were saying, by the fact that you're not entitled in a lot of places, or a lot of people say you're not entitled to any Brady evidence before you have to decide whether to accept a plea. Um, and so a lot of times these things never come to light. But one, one thing that's related that I just want to point out, and it's kind of a consequence of the fact that you have these really robust immunity doctrines, is that because you don't have a lot of incentive for uh, private practitioners in, in civil litigation to go after prosecutors, and even nonprofits who are kind of scared of losing funding or, having, or, or losing cases are you know, sort of scared of going after prosecutors, is that the main people whose job it is to notice and find and point out prosecutorial misconduct are um, the criminal defense lawyers who are on the line every day. And a lot of times when you do that, when you decide to point out a prosecutor's misconduct, you get punished by the fact that you can't make deals in your other client's cases. So if you come in one day and you say, you actually hid evidence in this case, it's a huge ethical violation, you embar embarrass that prosecutor on the record, um, the next day you, you might have to go back, you, probably will have to go back to that exact same guy and try to get a deal for your client. Um, it's totally, you're totally at this prosecutor's mercy. So it really has a chilling effect on those public defenders too. So there's a lot of institutional factors that mean that the people who it falls to now um, aren't gonna be able to unearth that misconduct, don't have kind of an ability to robustly do that. One solution that I've seen in one office, the um, Las Vegas Public Defender's Office has actually created kind of a Brady sting unit so that all the Brady and misconduct um, goes through a special unit rather than going through their line public defenders so that you don't have the same people accusing people of misconduct. But of course, I mean, you're still informing the steam unit of the problem, so it, does, it just do, it doesn't solve it. Um, I mean, it's a good idea, but it doesn't, it doesn't fix the problem. I mean, you really, it's just kind of one of the other methods that would be ferreting this out that's totally hamstrung. Um, so the solution is the strategic litigators who don't have Defense clients, is that what you're trying to say? Well, I mean, I, th I think that the fact that you don't have people um, who are incentivized to kind of investigate these cases because they think that they're unwinnable is a huge problem because you've already got a system where all the institutional actors are sort of captured by the institution and have all these like institutional pressures not to point out misconduct. Or a lot of times, I mean, one thing that I'll, I'll hear a lot is if you find that a prosecutor's committed misconduct and you're a public defender, I spend a lot of time talking to line public defenders about sort of what they do usually what they'll do is they'll take the Brady evidence to the prosecutor and say, hey, I found this. I'm not gonna put it on the record, but I'd like you to dismiss the case or I'd like to make a deal. And then, so nobody but those two people ever know that that happened. The judge never knows. A lot of, I mean, I'd like to think the client knows, but I bet the client often doesn't know. Um, it, it just gets really back room. So I think because of that, there's just not a lot of um, information about kind of what's going on those offices, if you had a big case where you were investigating like a pattern and practice of Brady misconduct, um, you would be ideally unearthing all those examples. But even doing that now is really difficult because there's it's so often back to you. The only way you could do it now is by doing a bunch of interviews. You'd be getting like a bunch of anecdotes and cases. You wouldn't even have documentation of a lot of the misconduct that goes on. I don't know the solution. That's just a big problem. I'm still thinking about the solution. I don't know if I'm the person to solve it. Um, it might be Cato, but... Um, there's no easy solution. But, but you know, just better ways of doing it. Like almost every other way is better than the way we are doing it. Right. I. That's a really good summary. <laughs> I don't have a safe solution, sadly. Great. Well, I, I didn't do a very good job of manufacturing conflict on this panel, but I feel like uh, I feel like uh, we, we have put a lot on the table. And thank you all for some wonderful speakers and great questions. Uh, I guess uh, we're going to wrap up now, probably. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks.